Hello, everyone. Welcome to the channel. I'm so happy to have you here today. Uh, I have something planned for you guys that I never thought I would have the pleasure of being able to do. It's going to be an interview with King Gary himself. That's right. King Pokemon is doing a Zoom call interview with me. I have several questions I prepared for him on the topic of MetaZoo. As somebody who's struggling to uh, come to terms with a lot of aspects of it, I hope this clears some things up. I'm really looking forward to hearing his input on MetaZoo, and I'm sure you guys are as well. This is going to be a real treat, so I hope you guys enjoy the interview. Hi there. Welcome, Gary. Hello, Hillary. Nice to see you. So nice to see you. So, so many people know you from your, from having the biggest Pokemon collection on the planet, right? Oh. But you've embraced this new TCG with open arms, MetaZoo. And I know myself, I'm not very familiar with it. There's a few things that I found to be odd about it, but I really want to learn more. So I want to thank you so much for coming on the channel and talking with us today. Well, sure. I, you know, something interesting happened today. Uh, besides my typical things with my daughter, which I know you very much so understand, mm -hmm. you know, being up at 545, getting her ready for school and and then uh, at nine o'clock, 9 a.m., getting a call that she's coughing. And and because of the covid stuff, they wanted me to come and pick her up and go take her to the doctor and get an approval to come back. But oh, she wow. has uh, she has severe allergies. Oh. And uh, and she's treated with uh, like fluticasone and, mm. and cough stuff. So that's been going on for two weeks. But like yesterday was the first day of school. And so now they need to be sure. And You're then right, right. At, then at one o'clock, I took her to uh, three therapy sessions, three half hour ones. And then we fed the birds. And then we went to... <laughs> And then we had the uh, three more therapy sessions from five to seven. And so, you know, that that's kind of like the glamorous life that we lead, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, I hope she's feeling better now. Yeah. I, yeah, I can well, relate she, to allergies for sure. They could be rough. <laughs> yeah, yeah, she, yeah, she was fine. But, you know, they're so worried about, you know, somebody getting, bringing COVID in that, you know, but, and I, I explained to them, but they said, well, they need it in writing and, you know, understandable, just trying to be safe. Yes, of course. Yeah. So I think to, you know, round off the interview here, started off, I would love to hear your very first experience with MetaZoo, how you first came across and what your initial thoughts were. Sure. Well, this actually goes back to last year. Mm -hmm. I'm a incorrigible collector. I love trading card games and I, I love, you know, playing games and uh, just about everything that's come out since the 1960s, I've either have or I had at one time. And so, you know, things like Adam's Family and Munsters and oh, nice. uh, I mean, whether they were playing games or, uh, you know, TCG or collectible games, I just love them. So, I always keep my eye out for things like that. And when MetaZoo, when I first saw the MetaZoo, they were running a little Kickstarter, not mm -hmm. much, just a little one. And uh, when I saw that, I, you know, I read to see what it was to see if it had any chance at all, you know, to uh, actually go into production, you know, because then I would, you know, send them a few bucks and, and uh, you know, just build another set. I love set building. You know, I, yes. love, I love collecting and set building, <laughs> filling those holes. You know, every time filling a hole, it, it's just so rewarding. And so, you know, I read it and I was so impressed with the concept. It, it's kind of how I felt when Pokemon came out and then really? how I felt when Yu-Gi-Oh came out. And I thought, you know, boy, these, you know, the, these are terrific ideas. And uh, knowing with Pokemon, especially that the you know how well it did in Japan, mm -hmm. uh, you know this this didn't have that kind of history, but you know those are all made up characters, the Yu-Gi-Oh characters and the Pokemon. You know they're all they all come out of artists' minds, and you know which I love also. Mm -hmm. But this one were actually you know you know real you know mythological characters like Bigfoot and. I mean, everybody can name the ones for their regions. And so when I saw that, you know, I felt the same way I did when Pokemon came out. I thought this, 
this is a genius idea because it has a even though it didn't have a history prior to that you know like uh pokemon had you know game boys and and all and a cartoon and the foreign release the japanese release you know excellent release they had mm -hmm. uh this actually had characters that people knew so it had a, a built-in a built-in audience that was interested plus there's a lot of people that especially those like me who like historical uh historical things uh and are you know kind of students of history it's uh it just has a built-in audience and i thought well this is terrific and it sounds like so much fun that i you know put some money into it and uh and you know i was glad i did so that that was my first exposure wow that's fantastic yeah, yeah. so i i'm not very familiar with cryptids myself i know of them um uh -huh. i just never knew much about them before hearing about metazoo uh, so i'm wondering what your favorite cryptid is yeah well i'm sure you had heard of many of them like bigfoot and loch ness monster jersey devil piazza bird you know there's a lot of really super famous ones but the really cool ones are the ones that aren't that famous you know they're for like the smaller regions and like for me in the south there's a uh, cryptid called uh joint snake and it's a it's a snake that gets cut up with a knife and then it can you know bring itself back together and thrive oh, wow. and then if you actually take a knife and and part a uh, part of the snake doesn't come back together or gets taken away the knife itself becomes a part of the joint snake. I know it's kind of gruesome <laughs> in that, but but the thing I love about it is the reverse foil of it has the reverse in sections. Like there's a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, a bit here, and it's just it's just uh, fascinating. It kind of reminds me. In, in fact, I personally I like the reverse foils much better than the hollow foils. It kind of reminds me of, you know, like the shiny Charizard, you know, yes. where, right? Yes. And the Charizard is is just gold and he's, and he stands out and you have to look closely to catch the background in that many people, when you mention the shiny Charizard, all they see is that golden Charizard, you know, they don't think of the background. And so, you know, that's kind of how these reverses look. They, they just look so, they just look so cool. And uh, so I would say my favorite is the joint snake. Yeah, for sure. And then, of course, it's hard not to like, you know, Mothman. And uh, uh, I would say, I would, let me see, the next one, maybe, maybe the Bigfoot. I know that's kind of a <laughs> common pick, you know, but it's, it's pretty exceptional. You well, know, yeah, the Bigfoot's artwork. very iconic. Yeah. For sure. And then the Mothman, I thought the image of the Mothman on the pack is very striking. Uh, I can definitely see the appeal there for that. Right. And yeah. I was curious if there's any cryptid that you, you would like to see in a card that isn't a card yet. Yeah, actually there is. Uh, I spent, you know, quite a bit of time in Vietnam and there's actually a, a cryptid there called Ahul, A-H-O-O-L. And it's like uh, some people think it's a dragon. Uh, it looks a bit like a dragon. Some think it thinks it's a large bat, uh, full size, you know, uh, human size in that. And uh, you can just imagine, you know, with all the imagination in Asia and all those things, there's terrific cryptids there. Now, none of those are included, you know, out here yet. In this set, he is going to branch out, though. So that that's the good thing. So I know these great cryptids from Indonesia and China, and I mean Japan per capita probably has the most of all, and uh, Yohai in Japan, and uh, so you know I that's probably the one I would pick is the Ahul because it was so popular in Indonesia and Vietnam, you know, when I was there. So. Oh, that's fascinating. I'm going to have to look that one up when we're done with this uh, interview here. So yeah. uh -huh. um, the next thing I'm wondering is, is what do you think about the current secondhand market with MetaZoo right now? Do you think that's critical for its success? Are you unhappy about it? I, th I think it's insane. I mean, I mean, why? You know, it just doesn't make, but you know, I can say that because fortunately I'm kind of in the position 
where that part, you know, just doesn't have to matter a whole lot to me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I can, you know, you know, pretty within reason, I can pretty much buy what I want. Yep. And, and I, and I hate selling things. I, mean, <laughs> me I, too. I, I, I hate selling things. I mean, if, if I could show you around my desk, it's, it's all, you know, it's, it's all, you know, I've been playing with the MetaZoo. It's all, you know, MetaZoo stuff. And, uh, you know, I actually have one graded card, even a, a Mothman. That's pretty cool. Oh, wow. Uh, and then I have, I have the, the commons, uncommons, you know, packaged and numbered. And oh. uh, in other words, I, I love this stuff so much. I, I don't want to sell it. And <laughs> I do understand that there's a, you know, a lot of money on the second, you know, on the secondhand market. Uh, but that, it doesn't affect me because I don't want to sell my stuff anyway. Right. And, you know, may, maybe, you know, maybe if I last an, another 20 years, you know, then my boys, but my boys are, are incorrigible collectors too. They love this <laughs> stuff too. My son, Pokemon Prince, Devin, uh, I mean, he goes to shows and appearances with me and he participates and like uh, we were in Denver two weeks ago, Denver, Colorado at Rocky Mountain Collectibles where they were doing tournaments, Ellis Madalena up there. And uh, they did a, a big Yu-Gi-Oh tournament and a Digimon tournament, a Pokemon tournament, uh, which I love all those. And then they did, uh, uh, it was opening day. It was the it was the opening day of MetaZoo. And so they taught, they had like six MetaZoologists or whatever you call it, teaching the game. And then they actually had a 30 person tournament you know, for the very first MetaZoo, my son participated. I'm not smart enough to, to do that stuff, but <laughs> but he participated. And the funny, he says, listen, I got to the second round, dad, except he had a buy in the first round. So it didn't, <laughs> that really didn't mean anything. Uh, but but he, en he enjoyed that. And uh, Michael Waddell, uh, he was up there too, to help promote, you know, to promote the beginning gave away a ton of stuff. See, that's one thing that I just love about him is that he's not looking at this short term, you know, you know, success or not, he's not looking at this short term. He gives away all this stuff. He's, he's not, uh, he's looking long term, 20 years down the line. He has 100 pages. He's been working on this for five years. Oh, wow. Has, yeah, he has 100 pages of sets and ideas and cryptids and and descriptions and all this stuff that he's been working on for years. And uh, I just got a glance at it. You know, he doesn't really want anybody to dig deep into it. You know, but I, I did get a glance. He's a neighbor of mine now. He lives here in Las Vegas. So, you know, I get a chance to go out to dinner. We go out to dinner and, and our wives, uh, you know, seem to get along. So, uh, you know, but with him, I mean, that's what I like about it is that it's not a money thing now. It's what it is. It's all about uh, the success of the game and building the game. And he, he's a big Magic the Gathering fan. And he did, he learned a lot from that. And so because Magic the Gathering was unknown when it came out in 1993, I didn't collect Alpha or Beta I started, you know, I think I started with Revised with Magic the Gathering because there was nothing back then. And I, I didn't even hear about it. I wish I had because now those alpha betas are pretty strong. Right, you know, they're right. Hard, they're <laughs> real hard to get. And I, and I don't own very many of those, but I wish I did. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, so that that's, that's, you know, pretty much, you know, pretty much for me, I'm, I'm just impressed, you know, with the way that that he does his work, you know, with this game. And I think he's going to be a success because of it. And I, and I love the, the concept. And I think the game, uh, the game is going to really catch on. Now I have to tell you, I have no vested interest. You know, I'm not, I'm not a investor. I'm not, I, he's never even asked me to be anyway, not that he would want me anyway, but, uh, <laughs> But I, uh, you know, I got some things from the Kickstarter, and I mm -hmm. still have those. Uh, and then I, uh, then I purchased, I purchased some things through, you know, when the Kickstarter first started. But I paid outrageous prices, like everybody had to, because I wanted to complete my set. Yeah, and it was so hard. <laughs> and so, uh, 
And now with the first edition that came out, I got three boxes of the first edition and that's it. I'm not going to, you know, normally what Tuan Autism Instruct and myself do, like we did with those Kickstarters, we sold them all for the Aoki Foundation. And so it, uh, you know, we'll probably do that with these also. But remember, I'm, we're very fortunate. You know, number one, I've worked my whole life and I've saved money. You know, I've worked hard my whole life. And so I can afford to do this. And I don't begrudge anybody who can't. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people have the aspirations to do what I'm doing now. And probably in 30 years, when that time comes, they're going to be able to do a lot more than I can. So I, I only say, I only say that, I only say that because uh, it's the truth, you know, mm -hmm. it's just simply true. And it's not a bragging thing or anything. Uh, our charity work is everything, means everything to us. I Like, you know, we have a little autistic daughter. You know, I go to 13 therapy sessions a week. I take her because my wife is a special education autism uh, master's degree holder teacher. And so she teaches autistic kids. And so she uh, you know, she works teacher hours and that leaves me to do, you know, to do uh, everything that's needed, you know, for the little girl. And so, um, yeah, so anyway. You have your hands full for sure. And you do too. Yes, I sure do too. <laughs> I mean, well. if anybody yes, understands, you do. I know. Exactly. But rewarding, um, you know, my son's special needs, but I love every moment with him. And it's so enriching to watch him grow and just master these new skills every every new thing that he does just feels like a, a blessing really just it, i'm so thankful for the progress he's made especially in the last year i loved i loved the way you put that earlier in a note to me you know when mm -hmm. we were talking about our families i love the way you put that because uh you know the, these kids need people like you you know mm -hmm. they they need that kind of parenting and it's so hard, it can be frustrating and, and it can be tiring and, it, and the whole thing. But the way you talked about how it was rewarding, it is absolutely true. It me, I go, I go to sleep, it takes me 10 seconds to fall asleep. <laughs> but my last memories are from the day and that I feel the same way as you do, that there's absolutely nothing in this world I'd rather do than that regiment I told you about earlier, getting up at 545, the sickness, going to the doctors, going to the therapies. And, and I'm 67, you know, mm -hmm. so it's not, you know, it gets a little bit harder as you get older. But my last thought when I fall asleep is exactly what you said. And that is I, I felt privileged and rewarded by what happened during that day. And I just hope I can live long enough, you know, to, to see her you know, to see her get into her 20s and that. And, you know, my, my family does have a history of living a long time, you know, into their 90s. So maybe if I could just lose a little weight, you know, maybe I'd have a chance, you know, a chance to do that because I, I want more days just like today. Oh, yes. I, I completely agree with you. I cherish every moment. And, and the same thing at night, you know, before I go to bed, I just smile thinking about when my son smiles, I just... Mm -hmm. I feel his his happiness with every bit of my soul. It just warms my heart when he he's happy. I'm happy. Wow, yeah, exactly right. I love that. So we definitely have something we can relate to very much there, not oh, just the yes. Pokemon. <laughs> yeah, well, hopefully at some point we'll have a chance to get together and share some stories and and maybe introduce them to each other. I would love that. I'm yeah. sure they would get along great. Yes. And. Um, Oh, so I wanted to ask you, actually, what yeah. do you think about Mike Waddell not reprinting the damaged first edition booster boxes? Do you think that he there was a reason other than this, maybe the secondhand market or is it a time constraint? Is it not being able to reprint it? Yeah, you know, that uh, that has actually been asked to me a number of times and I have talked to him about it. We went out to dinner a couple nights ago and that actually came up because I ask, I hear about it so often. I asked them, you know, uh, you know, what percentage of boxes got damaged? You know, just curious. I know there was a 25,000 boxes done yep. and they all sold out immediately. They're all long. I can't get one anymore either. Uh, 
but I asked him uh, what percent, he said about 20%, so about 5,000 of those 25,000 boxes, now, unless I misunderstood him. You know, I, yeah, I hate to talk for him because I don't really know, but I believe he said 20% or 5,000, uh, you know, they didn't palletize them, he called it. I guess put them on pallets and wrap them securely. They shipped them uh, in a different way. So they, you know, rattled around. And also he mentioned that the boxes were a little bit bigger than the Kickstarter boxes. And so there was a little more room for them to move around. And so what oh. he told me, he said that for him to, uh, because they sold out way before release, right? Mm -hmm. He said that all he could do, he has one box. That tells you something. He, oh, really? He has one box. And so <laughs> that, that tells you how he sent them all to the card shops, you know. And then uh, the way he put it was that he said it would take me about four months to get sheets you know, they're, they come on large sheets. Yes. Uh, and then they, and then they're, you know, cut in China or something, you know, they get cut and, and then, you know, put together. And he said it would be about a four month uh, process. Oh, wow. Uh, to act, actually, that came up when I was asking if he was going to do any more anyway. And then, mm -hmm. then he started telling me about the damaged boxes. And so it'd be about four months away. And his second uh, release the second set is coming out in October and so these would be coming out after that and, mm. and the people the people didn't he said that nobody wanted to send them the boxes to be replaced because uh, he said the secondary market went crazy right, and I, right. I don't know what I don't know what they're up to but I hear I hear it's like 10 times or something and uh, just between us, uh, I believe the card shops pay less than forty dollars a box. Oh, okay. So, so, and then they sell them for seventy nine. You know, he wants everything to go through the card shops, and he wants them to be uh, uh, sold at MSRP. Mm -hmm. And any shop that doesn't, or if he hears differently, uh, he removes them from his. You know, from the distributors, he flags them. Oh, wow. Uh, okay. Because he, he wants everything to go MSRP. Now, you know, you can only control so much, you know, the secondary market is a powerful thing. Mm -hmm. And, and if somebody has a chance to get a box for 100 bucks, and sell it for 500, you're just simply going to have a lot of people do that. Right. And, and I, I really, I really hate to even talk bad about them. Because you know, I, I think, you know, there, but for the grace of God, go I, you know, what if, what if I needed to feed my family and I, I had an opportunity to make a thousand dollars, you know, with a couple, you know, so I don't know, you know, I, I don't know how to feel about that, but I, I don't like to criticize people, you know, just because I'm not in their shoes. But anyway, that's, uh, you know, that's pretty much the way that he, that he said that he, but then again, he also added that not one person has asked to return them, but that makes sense, I guess, with the secondary market, you know, right, because right. the cards didn't get damaged. The boxes got dinged and the cards inside, he said he hasn't heard of a single pack that got damaged. Now he said that if, if anybody purchased boxes from the, uh, from the LGSs, if anybody buys those, he said that, you know, he'll do all he can to replace them if they're damaged or something like that. It's just that, uh, the logistics of creating a new print run, especially after being transparent and saying he's only doing 25,000 boxes. Mm -hmm. uh, he said that that causes a problem in itself. So, I mean, I, I don't know, you know, I, I don't know what, you know, what to say about that. I, maybe if I was in his position, you know, maybe I'd do the same thing. I don't know, you know, Right, right. Well, yeah. it's an unfortunate situation that they did get dinged, and it's good to hear that the cards were not damaged. And it's hard to yeah. 
put ourselves in his shoes and how to handle that. But I do think that was very good insight. And to touch on the scalper topic, I mean, it's something that's affected Pokemon. And I have to agree with you. You know, I get frustrated with the prices over MSRP. It's something that really bothers me because I want kids and families to be able to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. But like you said, there's probably people out there who just genuinely need money and realize that this is a good way to make money. And we got to think about those people. Plus, this has happened three, four times over the last 23 years. 22 years of the English release. This has happened several times. It happened in 1999, the very beginning. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, you know, I wanted to get, you know, boxes and packs for my boys who were eight and nine at the time. And, uh, and I mean, I just didn't have any luck. I, I actually drove out of state looking for stuff, you know, coming from California, you know, going into Nevada and Utah and Arizona, just, just trying to find some Pokemon product for them you know, in my travels, I would always look for that. So yeah, this is this has happened before. And I don't know, I don't you think some of the blame belongs on the company, though, you know, that they, uh, you know, they, they could put out more product. You know, I'm, I'm not sure, you know, there again, the logistics of what that would take, you know, maybe they would need another supplier or another manufacturer or, but they're a big company. Remember, Pokemon is, you know, the biggest media franchise in history. You right. know, they're, they're a pretty big company. You, you would think they could keep up with demand, but maybe with the COVID thing and all that, it's, you know, it just made it more difficult. Uh, you know, there again, I'm not, I'm not in their shoes, so I don't know. But I, I do know that if I had a business, I would want to sell as much as possible. And, and I right, wouldn't right. want my customers angry, you know. <laughs> You know, that's actually a good segue into another topic I wanted to ask you. Uh Uh, Pokemon being the biggest IP in the world, basically, uh, what elements do you think that MetaZoo could use from Pokemon to help propel its success? Would you think like, you know, toys, uh, TV show, cereal, you know, things of that nature? What do you think would be the best for it to help succeed in the long term? Actually, I think you're 100% right. I mean, there's uh, you know, merchandise, you know, based on these successful games. Uh, I mean, I don't know what the percentage in, with Pokemon is like, let's just say plushes, mm-hmm. but it's huge. Oh, and, yeah. And so uh, I I would say, and, and also if I, if I could have a, I don't, I know you're not too familiar with, with uh, MetaZoo, but uh, one of the, one of the cryptids is called uh, Squonk. And, oh, I know Squonk. <laughs> oh, you do. He, Actually, funny story. Um, uh-huh. uh, my father, you know, talking, you know, playing with my son, uh, you know, baby just kind of, he made a funny noise. He goes, he would just make the sound and my, my dad would call it a squonk. It's just oh. kind of like a baby grunt. <laughs> so we would call him Squonky Boy or, you know, all these that funny is, little nicknames. And so when so- I saw that there was a squonk card, I said, oh, is it that funny? Squonk. <laughs> and and your dad actually knew that you know he because he knew that from somewhere right? right but but and so you know what he looks like squonk and just imagine in a plush you know with that face and you know just grabbing it and squeezing it and you know the for i mean i'd enjoy it as much as my daughter akara would enjoy it you know but <laughs> but i mean that's uh yeah i would say that uh pokemon has definitely taught a lot of lessons, a lot of us, a lot of lessons. And I mean, I see your shelves behind you, you know, with, uh, you know, with (laughs) with Psyduck and Meowth and, and all those. And that's, uh, I, I would really like to know what percentage of Pokemon is that and what percentage is movies, what percentage is, uh, their TV shows and, and stuff like that. Uh, something tells me it's it's spread out maybe pretty evenly or something i'm sure cards are not you know the biggest you know the biggest thing right you know but uh yeah so i would say metazoo could learn that you know and mm-hmm. and i'm sure he i mean i i didn't never discuss that with uh with michael uh but i mean he's a sharp cookie you know he's uh uh, he's a physicist and a mathematician. Oh wow! He, his, yeah, his background is in the sciences, and uh, and he's uh, 
you know, worked many years in that field. So, so he's smart. He knows what he's doing, but he loves TCG. And so he's put it all aside uh, to do what his dream was. And that was creating, you know, MetaZoo. And he started that about five years ago. And he was finally able to go full time when the COVID thing hit. Mm. And, uh, and now, and now this, this is his dream. And, and you know what, Hillary, even when, even when things, you know, don't work out, or even when things aren't good ideas or whatever, I, I love to support young people with ideas. You know, not that I'm a good judge because my, my, my taste is horrible. I, I, I'm, I'm wrong. If I had to pick a stock or something, I, I'm horrible, but I love to see passion. You know, I love to see, uh, I'd love to see you, you know, when you talk, I mean, you, you actually care about what you're saying. You, you're not afraid to express yourself. You care about what you're saying. And, uh, and just the way that, you know, when we've had a chance to talk about, you know, about your family, you know, it's the same thing. You're a passionate person. I, I just love to see passion in young people because, you know, that's really what it's all about. And it doesn't matter if you have a dream and you work so hard and if it doesn't maybe succeed as much as you wished it would, you know, it's, uh, you know, like Bill Gates said, it's, or it's Steve Jobs said, you know, it's the process. And it's, it's just the process that matters. The process is what has value. And like this, this video we're doing, you know, could be a complete bomb. And, and, you know, it doesn't matter if it is or it isn't, because it's something, you know, it's something that we're putting in an effort and we're trying to educate and we're trying to, you know, teach if we can. And, and if it doesn't work out, it doesn't, doesn't mean we didn't do a good job. You know, we did right. a good job and we care about what we're doing. You're doing this because you care. You're, yes. not doing, you're not doing this for any other reason, just because you care, right or wrong, good or bad, you care about, about it. And I'm doing it because I care too. I, I want MetaZoo to succeed. I, I want Michael and his, and his, uh, he has his, uh, his uh, girlfriend, Jessica, is a fashion designer. I, I follow her and I, I love seeing the things that she makes for people and stuff. I, I just like supporting people who care deeply about anything, you know? And, you know, you mentioned that COVID kind of enabled Mike to go full time into MetaZoo. And, you know, COVID did have a silver lining to it in some ways. You know, people are, were able to find better jobs after unemployment. I myself, uh -huh. I was unemployed during COVID and I started the YouTube channel, which, you know, I've put a lot of effort into and right. sure, it's not the biggest success, but I truly enjoy doing it. And it's become a hobby that I love. Uh -huh. and it's a lot of people were able to chase dreams with that bit of unemployment and that that bit of time off and staying home. I mean, it was, of course, you know, a big tragedy in many ways, but it really did have some silver linings for some people. Yeah. And, and I think you're absolutely right about him. I mean, I don't think I mean, I think eventually he might have been able to get it going, you know, eventually. But this way he was able to jump after four years, he was able to jump in with both feet mm -hmm. and. And look and look where he look where he is now. You know, look look where this game is. I mean, Tops, Tops is taking over, and and Tops is printing a a MetaZoo set. And uh, and I mean that that it's. I believe it. What a lot of it was because of the the COVID. I really do. Not that he wouldn't have succeeded in the future. You know, but certainly not as quickly as this happened when he was able to devote all his time to it. So right. Right. And then COVID also, you know, people at home looking for hobbies, it caused a huge explosion in the TCG market as well. So that's because, you know, Pokemon values, I mean, you saw those rise. Yeah, I know. I know. It's really something. Plus the popularity. Uh, I mean, I, I can't tell. I, like just today, I had the Guinness Book of World Records contact me. Oh, no and, way. <laughs> and they wanted, they wanted, well, like, you know, they want to do something with me on it. And, uh, and you know what which i'm not exactly sure what it was you know preliminary but mm -hmm. it was guinness book of world records when they talk about the world's biggest pokemon collection or something like that and you know that that that's pretty flattering and i'm not sure i want to go there but uh <laughs> yeah yeah but i i do i do agree with you there you know 
absolutely. It made it, it did make a big difference for a lot of us. And a lot of people who loved the hobby and loved their cards and collected for years, suddenly they had a lot of, lot of value mm -hmm. and they, they were able to sell stuff and, and purchase, you know, purchase the house of their dreams and, you know, things like that. And unfortunately, you know, for every extra dollar, somebody else is paying an extra dollar and that, and that's too bad. Uh, that's too bad, but, but hopefully, you know, what they bought is, you know, gonna have a little steady increase, hopefully. And, and if nothing else, they'll be like me, an old man with a ton of cards <laughs> who, who doesn't care, you know, who doesn't care if, if they, you know, what they're worth, because I totally don't care. You know, I, I seriously don't care. Uh, you know, I, I just love the hobby and I just love what I've done. And I love the, I, I love, uh, you know, being a part of it. I'm going to be like you when I'm older, because I'm not going to sell any of this stuff. Right. I, I bet you will. I know. I bet you'll be just like that. Yeah. Uh-huh. Um, so. And then your little boy, then your little boy is going to have a ton of stuff to mess with. Oh yeah, he already takes the cards and he holds them up. I mean, they're PSA one now that he played with them, but <laughs> right. Oh well. <laughs> um. So I was wondering if there's anything that you think could be done to improve the cards in any way. The, I'll tell you, my old eyes have so much trouble reading that text. Mm. Uh, the text on you know on these. And the more text it seems, the smaller it gets. So, <laughs> so for me, for me, I would have to figure out some way. But I know to make the test text a little bigger, you got to create a little more space, which might which might make the uh, the picture itself a little bit smaller. I'm sure there there's other things that go along with that. Mm -hmm. But but honest to God, I I I have difficulty reading it. Yeah. So font size, I mean, that's, that's a tough thing too, because, you know, like you said, encroaching on the image and, and yeah. trying to condense the text as much as possible, but have it still be effective in place. That That's a tough balance to try and capture for sure. I, I guess it is. I had that problem with a lot of the magic cards too, mm. magic, the gathering cards too, but even either more so with the meta zoo or just because my eyes are older than they were back then. I don't know. <laughs> I should see if there's any other topics here that I wanted to cover. Um, oh, do you believe that any of the cryptids might be real or have some truth to them? You know, I want to believe that. I want to believe that so bad. Uh, I mean, what I would give, I mean, I'd probably jump up on this table, but I'd love to see a hoop, a, a joint snake come crawling <laughs> through. Uh you, you, you know, Hillary, I'm not, I've never witnessed anything out of the ordinary like that. I, I love the idea of them being real. And uh, like, there's a, there's a lot, there's a lot of land that's unexplored that, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's been, been some Bigfoot sighting. I want to believe it, <laughs> but I've never seen it in, I, I think I'd be disingenuous if I said that I believed uh, that some were real. You know, I I just have no. But then again, I've never seen I've never seen God either, and I'm and I'm very much a man of faith. So, uh, and he, and there's no question he's no cryptid. So, <laughs> so I maybe that's a little hypocritical. I'm not sure. <laughs> yeah, I mean, there's what, some people what do you that think? believe. Let, let me ask you. You know what what do you, what do you think? about cryptids about the possibility of any of them being real or ever were real or or do people just make that up so i think that there are some mm -hmm. that could have some truth to them but be exaggerated so could somebody have seen something like bigfoot yeah could somebody have seen something like the loch ness monster yeah it may have looked like that to them right but i do think that there's some truth there to some of these but certainly some are entirely fictitious Right. Okay. So it's not just me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I want to believe I would love to find, you know, settings of, of some of those being real, but I, I think that it's somewhere in between. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, hopefully uh, it's kind of like with aliens, huh? 
you know, I, I you so much want to believe that there that there is life out there, and why wouldn't there be? But doggone it, why can't we just see it one time? I know. You know? <laughs> so last question for you here. Uh huh. Where do you think MetaZoo will be in one year's time, like 365 days from today? Yeah, one year, one year from today. And I would probably stretch it even further. I think it's an absolute lock. It's an absolute lock to be successful, uh, at least in the short term, you know, like for the next couple of years. Now, if if they continue to do the right thing, you know, which I have no reason to believe they don't, because I know how passionate he is about mm -hmm. this, uh, then I think there's going to be, you know, long-term interest. And uh, I think they'll uh, start getting the gameplay. The gameplay is so important, you know, have to have to these, uh, which is why he wants to do everything through the game stores, because Walmart's not and Target, they're not going to run tournaments. You know, it's going to be these little, you know, mom and pop game stores that are going to run tournaments and, and the interest. And I know he's focused on that. Uh, so I, I would say, if I had to say a year from now, I would say, you know, hold on, you know, you know, hold, hold on to your, you know, hold on to or make, keep the game shops, you know, keep them going, you know, try to participate in their tournaments, try to, you know, collect the cards, you know, there's, it's multifaceted. Uh, I was with uh, D Brews today, who's also one of my neighbors, and he's the, you know, he's the shirt designer in, in that, and him and I were trading, we're trading uh, our MetaZoo cards, trying to complete a second set, and so we're going back and forth, and I have it, I get show you, I have it on my phone, you know, the cards that I have extras of that I can trade. And I mean, that that's just that it's it's just a fun thing, you know, about MetaZoo, like everything else, besides them being cryptids, which I'm interested in anyway. And if you look up these cryptids on the internet, uh, if you Google one of them, I mean, there's hundreds of pages, you know, there's a lot of interest, you know, people have a lot of interest in those guys. And, and they're, they're fun, you know, they're fun to read about. What I'm, what I'm doing with, with Akara is some of the mild, some of the milder ones, you know, there, some are a little bit, you know, gross or a little bit scary, but some <laughs> of the milder ones, you know, I, I look them up, you know, I put them, I put a video on the TV, we watch it, I read something about the character, then I give her the card and I say, this is that character. Uh, and she uh, and she absolutely loves that, and and so it can be used as a little bit of a teaching tool. Though I mean, also in not just a Pikachu or a Psyduck, you know, but this is something that a lot of people believe in, and uh, and they're regional. You know, they uh, his product come with little maps, and and the maps show what region of the country these crit, you know uh, specific cryptids are from, and so now you can suddenly start talking about you know, California and Virginia and, and Alabama and, and all that. So it can be used as a fun little teaching tool. And that's, that's what I do. Uh, and, and it's, it's amazingly successful. But then again, you know, you know, the little girl is autistic, and she has a real distinct focus. Mm -hmm. And so when, when you show something, she gets kind of obsessed with that, with that. And so she, you know, really enjoys it. Uh, so I, I don't know, maybe a neurotypical, you know, child might get a little distracted, but, uh, it can be used that way. And I, I remember you, uh, messaging me that and saying that I just said, wow, that's so great. I mean, you're giving me ideas for story time. I think that's such a fun idea. Right. Uh-huh. You yeah, know, my son will want to hear the same story 500 times. <laughs> it's fun yeah, to mix and, it up. <laughs> yeah. I wonder if Jack and the Beanstalk, if any of those are cryptids, I don't know. Oh, good question. I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure if they're based on any cryptids or or whatever. It well, it's kind of like uh, the blue ox came out in this set, mm -hmm. and Paul Bunyan uh, didn't come out in the Kickstarter, even though that's his ox, and yeah. that's a really interesting story. And and teaching the kids that story, and then being being able to show this is the blue ox, this is Paul Bunyan, 
uh yeah yeah it's a lot of fun it re- i don't know maybe i have more fun than she does i'm not sure but i <laughs> i know i have fun with that i really do but you know you know what i mean just oh see- yes just seeing the smile on your son's face you said that's enough all by itself but when you're doing something that puts that smile on his face i mean that's that's uh that lasts forever yeah i feel like a lot of people wouldn't want to read their child the same story 500 times but i would read it 500 and 5000 times just knowing that it makes him happy right it, it's it doesn't get old to me seeing his smile yeah that's right and and it's it's interesting how often they want to hear the same story over <laughs> and over again yeah <laughs> yes. true yeah but I want to thank you so much, Gary, for coming on the channel. I mean, your insight sure. is is so val- valuable and important to the TCG community. And you're, I just can't thank you enough for sharing and, and taking the time to come and talk to me. Well, you know, thank you also. Uh, I mean, way before we even discussed this, I watched you anyway. I know. <laughs> because I like, I like watching, I like watching, you know, stuff that, you know, affects the hobby. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and so... You know, I appreciate you letting me to come on, and and I and I like to think that, you know, maybe one year from today, you know, let's get together. I before that, but I mean, let's get together and review everything we talked about today to see what one year from today look really looks like. You know, that that would be kind of fun. I think that's a great idea. We should definitely one year from today meet again yes. and see where we're all at with this meta zoo and everything else in the tcg market i think that's a great plan that's a deal deal my friend you take okay. care and you also hillary thank you so much thank you bye bye wow everyone what an incredible conversation we got to have today with king gary himself i want to thank him again for coming on the channel and lending us his time for that interview i really appreciated that and enjoyed it very much uh, with that said I want to know what you guys think about what we talked about in the comments and MetaZoo in general. Please share your opinions down there and have a conversation amongst yourselves. I'd love to hear what you guys have to say. Also, if you enjoy the video, leave a thumbs up, subscribe, because I actually have some more TCG related interviews on the horizon that I don't think you guys are going to want to miss. It's going to be pretty exciting stuff. So I'm going to say bye for now and take care and I'll see you all very soon.